hits the reel. It's maybe a hundred yards in the backing, just screaming down to the bottom of the ocean. And all of a sudden, I hear this ding, and I look down, and my whole spool pops off of the of the reel. And I'm like, oh my god, this is the first marlin I've hooked in my entire life on a fly rod, and like I have my gear break on me, you know. And then all of a sudden, the captain's like, come on, man, get that shit together. Wait, you, you know what the f are you doing? So. I literally grab the backing and I just start hand lining the marlin. Ryan Johnston is a fly fishing guide, author of the book A Real Job, and runs the nonprofit Cast Hope. He has a ton of experience in the world of fly fishing and has watched it morph over time into something more accessible and attainable to a new generation of anglers. Whether fly fishing is difficult is for you to decide. Let's hear what Ryan thinks about this. The fly fishing is definitely taking a change over the last ten years. There's a new demographic, and it's really the social media dem- demographic, you know, of that kind of mid twenties to to forty year old male, you know, and and females now. Where previous to that, I mean, it was kind of a gentleman's sport. It, it kind of was like golf before Tiger Woods, right? It was what old guys did, and so I think for a long time we were told fly fishing was an art, right? It, you know, it was a lot easier just to go open a bale of a spinning rod and cast a lure and reel it back. You know, at the same time, I think there is a little truth to it. I think it is a little more complex than you know conventional fishing, you know, because there is casting involved and there is. You know, learning how to manipulate a fly or getting a dead drift or, you know, making your fly look realistic. But I think a lot of what we come up against, and I, I think this is going to continue to change, is that we're, we're, we've been taught that fly fishing is an art. And we have this history of fly fishing coming from Scotland and, you know, you have the spay fishermen and, you know, you have these beautiful hand tied flies with African monkey hair, you know, and like there's all these parts to it that, just feed the beast of like, this is a hard thing. The The reality of what you said, though, in general, fly fishing, once you have a basic understanding, like getting to the basic understanding, once you're there, it's really not that hard. I will say that learning the, you know, techniques of fly fishing, I find a lot more enjoyable. I, I grew up conventional fishing saltwater off San Diego. You know, my dad was a conventional fisherman. So there is no pride. I mean, fishing's fishing, whether you're fishing a red and white bobber, you're fishing an indicator, another style of bobber with a fly rod, and like it's it's all the same, man. I think we're getting away from that image that fly fishing is hard, but I still think that there's kind of that old guard, you know, the guys that are in their late 60s and 80s who are still in there and that have wanted to protect fly fishing as an art and not open it up to everyone. And I think this next generation, this kind of skate surf, that scene is is breaking that mold. With that being said, Ryan does believe that there is some truth behind the idea that fly fishing is more challenging than traditional fishing. Let's hear why he feels this way. Fly fishing is just complex enough that your brain is moving at all times, even as a guide. You know, you're, you know, like, oh, look at that drop off. Look at that ledge. Look at that current change. It's not just casting a lure, thinking about whatever you're thinking about and just reeling it and waiting for something to pull back. Like you have to stay in tune to everything, your fly, where your fly is at, how your fly is presenting. And so it's that complexity that makes it harder, but also the complexity brings a lot of like mental peace. It allows your brain to relax there. If fly fishing is just complex enough, you can't think about work when you're doing it. You can't think about your wife. You can't think about your kids. You know, if you really want to be a good angler, like if you really are focused into what's happening around you, what's happening with your fly at all times, your brain is constantly working. And I think that's the biggest appeal to most people. And so when you get off the water, yeah, you physically are tired, but mentally you're completely refreshed. And guiding is the same way because there's so much happening with two clients in the boat is that you have to pay attention to all these details. Is that at the end of the day, it's like, oh, you know, yes, I went to work today and I rode a boat and physically I'm tired or you went and walked a river or you waited, you know, whatever you did. But mentally, I'm like, I kind of feel refreshed. I kind of feel filled up, you know, and, and I think that's the part of fly fishing that a lot of conventional fishing is missing and people don't understand that. With a new generation coming up in the fly fishing world and in a time when buying and collecting new and shiny gear is the standard rather than the exception to the rule, Ryan has some thoughts on taking the time to learn the sport and the ecology it is based around as opposed to grabbing every shiny new rod off the shelf. The the rod or the reel doesn't make the fisherman. You know, the the, the experience on the water is what makes the fisherman. You, you can't replace time. So it doesn't matter what brand of rod you use. Like, I'm a Scott guy. You know, I, I love Scott products. But if you're getting into the sport, 
You don't need to go buy a six, eight hundred, nine hundred dollar fly rod. You know, go buy a two hundred dollar rod. You know, you're you're going to learn more from your time on the water. You're going to learn more from that time of being there, observing with your eyes, hearing. You know, and and really playing, right? Like, you know, trying new things, trying new methods, trying to dial out whatever fishery you're on. You know, if you make tons of money and you have a larger budget for fishing, you know, my experience, I would take that larger budget and go travel. You know, I mean, I always said as a guide, I'd much rather have someone show up in board shorts and flip flops and a flat build hat than, you know, a Sims pants and Sims shirt and, you know, Sims hat on, you know, looking like a catalog. One of my top clients, I fish with them 30 times a year. Uh, and this guy has plenty of money. He can afford anything he wants to buy. He still fishes this olive St. Croix rod that he bought back in the 90s. I mean, that rod has caught thousands and thousands of trout and steelhead, you know. So, yeah, he could go buy, you know, a $1,000 rod with this sweet looking reel. But, it, you know, it's not going to make him a better angler. I mean, he's a stick to begin with and it doesn't matter what rod you use, you know. As long as the reel works and it turns and doesn't get stuck, like, it costs fifty dollars or a thousand dollars. It's all going to reel efficient. Speaking of learning, entomology and fly fishing go hand in hand. But to the new angler trying to wrap your head around it can be quite intimidating. Ryan dispels some of the myths about the bugs that fish eat, and more importantly, about the flies needed to catch these fish. When it comes to entomology, that's easy. Like once you kind of learn what bugs look like, you can go out there. You can open your fly box and say, "Oh." This is about the same fly size. This is about the same silhouette. Like this is probably going to work, you know, rarely are fish dialed into one pattern, you know, like there's this common belief that you have to have well, this one fly to catch them. It's probably not true. And all the rivers I guide, it's not true. Now that one fly might have 15 patterns that look like it. And as long as you're using one of those 15 patterns, it's going to work. Now, one of those ones might be a touch better than the other. You know, maybe the fish like this slightly different hue, the color, or the, the, it's more about the profile. Maybe the, you know, the fly is tied a little bit thinner or something. But in general, if there's a size 14 mayfly hatching, whether it's a pale morning done, uh, a pale evening done, a March brown, I mean, there's all these, you know, some kind of drake, uh, there's all these different kind of mayflies, you know. A bunch of your flies are tied to be a mayfly, right? Like in, in general patterns. So whether you have the specific pattern or not, it really doesn't matter. You know, um, it's more about having, you know, somewhat close to what it looks like. I think we a lot, a lot of times overthink fly fishing. You know, in our head, we've been told it's this hard thing. And we have to be so accurate with our entomology and our casting. If your flies in the water and it's somewhat close to what's hatching, you have a chance of catching a fish. You know, and at that point, it turns more into the you know angler skill level than it is about what rod you're fishing, what fly you're fishing, what reel, what you're wearing. Like, you know, the list goes on forever. You know, it, the the angler skills would catches them, not not everything else. In regards to learning new things about fly fishing, Ryan has fished just about every way imaginable and has some thoughts on some of the most productive ways to catch fish with a fly rod while out on the water. You know, nymph- nymphing in general is more productive than any other style of fishing for trout, largely because a trout's diet, you know, food they're eating, 90% of it is subsurface, right? So only 10% of that rest of the food is going to be happening on top. So only 10% of the time is that dry fly really going to work. But a fish has to continue to eat on a daily basis, right? I mean, they are a living animal. So they're eating, you know, small midges, they're eating small nymphs. And so nymphing in general is going to catch more it's not as enjoyable as watching a dry fly, you know, because the dry fly, you get the visual take. It's no different than fishing a top water for a small mouth or a large mouth, you know, like, you know, so in terms of nymphing versus streamer fishing, uh, streamer fishing, you're generally going to catch larger fish, you know, just because you're targeting that more predatory fish that, that the fish is who's eating other fish. So in general, people say if you want to catch larger trout, if you fish streamers, and that's the way to go. You will catch just as large a fish on an nymph, but your odds are you're going to catch a bunch of small, medium-sized fish to get to that large fish, right? So what happens is when you throw the streamer is you then get rid of the small and medium-sized fish's ability to eat your fly. So when you commit to that streamer, you know, you're going to fish longer periods of time with less, you know, numbers of fish being caught, but you're trying to maximize the odds of catching the big one. That's what you're doing. You know, but the thing about nymphing and the appeal of nymphing is that it's actually a pretty simple, you know, concept of how to catch them. 
so yeah, you can nymph anywhere. You can nymph in riffles, you can nymph in runs and deep, slow water. Like it just, you know, you'll have to, you know, vary your amount of weight you're fishing and how deep you're fishing, you know, so your indicator can be adjustable. You know, you can, you, you can nymph two feet of water, you can nymph 10 feet of water. It really depends on what kind of river or, you know, situation you're in. So you can nymph in still water. It's not as fun, you know, it's a lot of just bobber watching. Um, you know, I prefer nymphing and moving water and streams and rivers. You know, there's a lot of, you know, edges and drop offs and current lines. You know, there's, there's a lot to reading all that. Someone like Ryan travels all over the country and fishes for various species. Let's learn how he is able to take what he has learned over the years and put it into practice no matter where he goes or what new situations he finds himself in. Fish knowledge is fish knowledge, right? So every time you go to a new place or you go to your local lake, you you are constantly learning something, you know? And so a lot of what we talk about in fishing is fish behavior, right? So the way a smallmouth acts in Ohio is probably similar to a smallmouth in Wisconsin. Their behavior is going to be the same. So all your local fishing is applying to all the smallmouth there in the entire world, you know? So every time you go fishing, you're constantly learning, you're constantly picking up little tricks, right? You might be trying something new and be like, oh, that worked really well, or that was a stupid idea. I didn't catch anything. So your, your learning knowledge transfers everywhere. So when you become an expert in largemouth or smallmouth, or let's say trout, you know, uh, steelhead, whatever, uh, all that applies, right? So the way a steelhead sits in Ohio and the water they like in Ohio is the same water they like in California, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia. There's some level of confidence, like once you get to that point, they're like, you can go to any smallmouth river or creek and you're probably going to catch them just because of your own knowledge of how they act at your own home waters, right? Trout are the same way, right? I mean, trout are all, they live in riffles, they live in drop-offs, they live in current changes, you know? Um, so it doesn't matter if you're in California, if you're in Michigan, you're in Colorado, Montana, like they all live in the same water. So, you know, taking that is, that level of confidence is where you start. Wherever you're successful in in Ohio for smallmouth and you go to a different smallmouth creek, you're going to look for that same kind of structure, that same kind of water situation that you do at home. And you're probably going to be successful because smallmouth are still the same animal. They're just living in a different place. Second thing I do when I travel to places I haven't been is I'm online. You know, I'm going to Google the local fly shop. They're usually going to have some kind of stream report. You can go through blogs. You can read what, what their guides are using, what they're recommend it, recommending. And then you're going to use that information with the knowledge you already have from your own fishing. And you're going to create kind of a, a strategic plan of what's going to happen, right? Step three would then be calling that fly shop, you know, and calling the local, you know, outfitter. And to be honest, most people give you legitimate information. Are they going to open the whole book and tell you every secret? Absolutely not, because they have to protect their own home waters. But they are going to give you enough information that you can go out and be successful, you know. And if you get there, a little trick for people traveling, when you go into a fly shop, don't just go in there and ask information. Like go in there with the plan of I'm spending $20 and I'm probably going to buy some flies that I may not need. But that $20 is going to give me access to information from the owner or whoever is working there. If you walk in there and just say, hey, I want to know how to fish and which I use and you're not spending any money, they're not going to open up. Ryan has written a book called A Real Job that details his life as a guide, and in this book, he tells some pretty hilarious stories. Let's see where he got the idea for A Real Job and learn why you should read it. You know, I, I have a gift of storytelling, and uh, I was on a hosted trip with some clients, and one of my clients asked me, hey, just tell us one of your funniest guide stories, you know, so I, I rattled off a story, and everybody's laughing, and then, you know, that turned into a second story and a third story, and Next thing you know, you know, I've been rattling off guide stories for like three hours. My dad was one of the guys on the host trip. And uh, the next morning, you know, we're sitting there drinking coffee before we're about to take off fishing. And he's like, wow, last night was awesome. He's like, do you realize you had the whole table of entertain for like three hours? And I was like, yeah, it was really fun. He goes, you know, there's something there. And um, whether it's just for yourself or for our family, like, I think you should write some of those stories down. And so I had a day off of guiding and uh, I went to a coffee shop on my laptop with just an idea of like, oh, huh, maybe I'll write something down and uh, open the laptop up and started typing. And so um, I wrote down a chapter and I was like, wow, like I actually enjoyed that for me. It took about a year to write the book. And then it came to the editing process and right about the editing process, we had baby number two. 
And then my time really got tightened up. And, um, and so it sat there for like seven or eight years. Nothing. It was all written. I just needed to hire an editor and go back through it. And the book is actually fruit of COVID. And I never expected the response. You know, I, I wrote it for myself. My hope was just to sell enough copies to make my cost back of paying the editor and the designer and the book cover. And so it's not a bestseller, but, you know, at this point, I've sold a couple thousand copies. And so many people asked for a second book that, you know, about a year ago, I started the process of writing the sequel. And it's going to be coming out probably March of 24. So I'm pretty pumped on that. Derek D. Young, the famous fly fishing artist, he actually designed the cover for the second book coming out here in a couple of months. In A Real Job, Ryan talks about Big Fish Mojo and how he is not blessed with it, just like myself. How does one get Big Fish Mojo? Well, there's only one way to attain it, unfortunately. Big Fish Mojo is in the book. I refer to it. It's a, it's a gift given to by the fish gods. So there are certain people chosen in this world who have been bestowed this gift to drive the rest of us crazy. Uh, my father is this guy. Okay. So my father uh, is an average fly fisherman. You know, he knows enough to get it done, but he would not be considered a good angler anywhere he goes. You know, he, uh, I have tried to teach this guy how to double haul for 15 years. He cannot do it. And I have given up like, all right, man, you're a 50 foot caster. You will never be anything greater than that. And so we'll go on trips together. And for some reason, he always catches the biggest fish every trip. But mathematically, if you think about it from like a logical point of view, I'm out fishing him two to three, two to three every single trip we're on. So mathematically, like it's not possible, right? Like if every trip for, you know, for my entire lifetime, you know, I'm catching two to three times as much as him. Like at some point I have to get the big one and it literally has never happened. My dad has been on the front of magazines and the sports section, holding up some big jackpot fish on a conventional fishing boat. You know, he catches like huge steelhead all the time. Like he just has this magical gift. And like I said, I, I believe it's bestowed on the fish gods. Like they just, they select a few chosen people to drive the rest of us hardcore anglers absolutely bonkers. And social media is just feeding that, <laughs> you know, like how many guys you see on social media are like, dude, what do you fish like three times a year, you know, and you're holding like a 20 pound fish up. Like how did that happen? You know? I don't know. I'm a huge believer. I've seen it in my clients. I have a client. You know, his name's Gene. I, I, his nickname is now Big Fish Gene. Gene is a guy that travels all over the world. He is an extremely good angler. And, you know, he has my personal best striper in my boat at 49 pounds, you know, on a fly rod. He's got my biggest Feather River steelhead at 12 pounds. I mean, you're talking thousands of days of guiding. And, like, three of my biggest fish I've caught in different rivers all come from Gene. So, he actually kind of deserves it because he actually does know what he's doing. And, you know, but my dad doesn't deserve it at all. I love the guy to death. He's one of my best friends, but he has the big fish mojo. And sadly, he did not pass that gene on to his son. A gift from the fish gods is hard to come by. And so is reeling in a 160 pound marlin. Ryan has a wild tale to tell of his adventure handlining in a huge marlin while fishing off the Pacific coast with his father. What a wild ride that was. But I, I think the appeal of saltwater fishing is really connecting to an animal that is so strong. It's so much stronger than anything that lives in freshwater, you know, and you don't you're not in control like that fish is pulling that line so hard or ripping line off the reel. You know, it, it's a whole nother experience. I hosted a group of guys November of 22 for my 40th birthday. I planned kind of a hosted trip with my best clients and my dad. And uh, we all went down to Mag Bay in Baja um, and we went down there targeting striped marlin on flies, you know, and, you know, these fish are ranging from 100 to 200 pounds and casting 12 weights at them with, you know, streamers that are 12 inches long with five odd hooks. My dad and I, our first day, we hooked eight marlin in one day. Uh, my dad gets me to the front of the boat first time. And so I cast, I hook a fish off the first school. It hits the hits the reel. It's maybe a hundred yards in the backing, just screaming down to the bottom of the ocean. And all of a sudden I hear this ding. And I look down and my whole spool pops off of the of the reel. And I'm like, oh my God, this is the first marlin I've hooked in my entire life on a fly rod. And like I have my gear break on me, you know? And so I mean I've 
I've had these situations happen with clients, so I knew what to do. So I just grabbed the spool and I just threw a bunch of slack on the ground because the fish was swimming as fast as it could. And so I'm trying to get the spool to reconnect and spinning it and I can't get to reconnect and I'm about to run out of line again. So I throw another 30 feet on the boat deck and backing, just straight backing on the deck, trying to get in. And all of a sudden the captain's like, come on, man, get that shit together. Wait, you know, what the F are you doing? I'm like, dude, I know what I'm doing. I'm trying, you know, and I'm like panicking in that exciting moment, you know, and, and then all of a sudden I'm throwing more line on the deck and I, I can't get the spool to go back onto the reel. You know, and I was like, here, you try. So I literally threw more line on the deck. I hand him the whole rod and the spool. And so he's trying to manipulate it, you know. So we we do this for like, I don't know, in this whole situation, maybe 90 seconds, right? And he can't get the spool to go back on the reel either, you know. And he's like, ah, dude, I, we're hosed. Like, you know, I was like, this is the first, mar- I don't know if I'm going to hook another one, right? Like, I mean, I'm so pumped. Like, who hooks a marlin on a fly rod? Like, 1% of fly fishermen in the world. I mean, this is like, you don't do this, right? So I literally grab the backing and I just start hand lining the marlin. So he's just like looping the backing on the reel as I go. And, you know, I'm being really close. I don't want to get my hands ripped apart, you know? And so, but luckily at that point, the fish has just sounded right. And he's just, it's just dead weight. And so, you know, a little bit, and he'd take a little line out, but I'd gain, you know, 10 feet. He'd take two, right. And eventually I got back to the fly line and, uh, all of a sudden where I was rubbing the fly line on my hand as I was sliding the line through my, the fly line through my hand, like I started getting this hot spot, you know, I'm like, oh man, this is going to turn into a blister. So I was like, hey, do you have any some gloves? And, and uh, he's like, no, I got a rag. So I like, I'll take the rag. So I put the rag in, in my stripping hand and I'm stripping it. It took me probably 35 minutes, but I hand lined my first Marlin in and uh, we had an American kind of guide with a Mexican captain. And when the American guy had grabbed the bill of the fish, the Mexican captain just erupted in celebratory. And like, he's like all this Spanish, he's like jumping up and down. And like, he runs to the front of the boat and gives me like this hug. I don't even know this guy, right? Like this is the first morning I've ever met him. And this Mexican captain gives me like this huge long hug. And, and then I'm like asking the American, like, what is he saying? He's like, dude, he, that dude is so proud of you right now. He goes, you're like young man in the sea. <laughs> And then the next morning, so the day two of fishing, all the we had four boats. There was eight of us down there. All the Mexican captains came over and shook my hand the next morning. <laughs> yeah, you know, like it was like this, like celebratory, like oh man, like you you've proved yourself, you know. And they're like, no one we've ever guided would ever do that. They would just break it off, and we'd go find another school of fish. I I didn't know if I was going to hook another one, like right, like I I wasn't. I was so determined I wasn't going to let it go. Um, it's one of the few fish I've ever handlined, but end up being like 160 downs. <laughs> pretty, pretty wild experience. Uh, we then eventually went on and caught others with, you know, different reels and, you know, had a great time. But that was uh, my first marlin on a fly rod experience. Aside from being a guide and an author, Ryan is also making a change in the world for the better. He runs the nonprofit Cast Hope, which takes underserved youth fly fishing and teaches them about this amazing sport. Let's learn about Cast Hope and how you can get involved. Uh, so Cast Hope started in 2009. Um, really, the organization came from my wife and I attend a Presbyterian church in Chico, California. And our pastor was talking about using your personal gifts just to change your local community, you know that message really hit me. You know, most people walk out the door and whatever was talked about goes in one year and out the other, but I just couldn't get it out of my head. So I really started evaluating what I was doing for my, my own community in Chico. And so I decided I was just going to donate one trip a month to underserved kids, you know, kids who are having a hard time in life. And then six months into this process, you know, just donating one trip a month, um, took a junior high kid out with his uncle. So we were on the lower Sacramento river, uh, which is a great trout river in Northern California. And so we went out there and the kid caught his first fish, had a good time. And then he caught his second fish. And that second fish, he just lit up like a light bulb and we landed it. We took pictures. We had that hero moment, let the fish go. And then I'm sitting there on anchor and the fit, you know, the kid's in the front of the drift boat, his uncle's behind me. And so the kid turns around, looks at his uncle and goes, this is the coolest thing I've ever done. I want to start fly fishing with you. I want to go buy a rod. And I just had this huge you know, we call it a holy shit moment, a God moment, whatever you want to call it. And I just, I have to figure out how to do this more than once a month. In our belief in today's world, kids are so used to instant gratification, right? 
Like they're addicted to screens. They're addicted to social media. We created this business model of taking kids out with guides and connecting them with a fish as fast as possible. You know, if you can connect that kid to a fish as quickly as you can, then you have a higher chance of retaining the kid. You know, so my vision, largely being from a guiding background, was, you know, what's the highest odds of a kid catching a fish? It's like, well, put them in a guide boat, someone who does this for a living, who's on the water all the time. And instantly, the, the chances of the kid's success skyrockets, right? So um, I went to my buddies and said, you know, I know that you guys would be happy to donate a few trips a year, but you guys make a living out of this. So if I ask you for 20 trips a year, you're going to tell me no. But what if I paid you half of what you normally would make? And so most of my friends were like, you know, you're not going to get me during prime season, but on shoulder seasons when I'm not fully booked, like I, I would love that. And so we founded the whole organization around that model of taking kids for their first time with guides. And after they've been on that first guide trip, I mean, we're, you know, we use the word hook them, right? Like we're, we're hooking them and catching them with success. Um, and then a couple months later, we offer them another guide trip. And then a couple months later, we offer them a third guide trip, you know? And then after about four or five guide trips, then we say, okay, like you actually like this. You want to keep doing this. Now you want to learn how to truly cast. Now you want to learn how to tie flies. And then after that, like fourth or fifth trip, then uh, we give them all the gear they need. You know, we give them fly rods, reels, flies, leaders, everything they need to do. And then we try to teach them how to fish a local spot around their house within about 30 to 45 minutes. Something that's repeatable, something where they don't need cast hook guides. So it's grown a lot. I feel really blessed. I feel really humbled by the process. We have 700 kids in our program at the moment. And we have four regional directors, uh, you know, like I said, in those four different regions who oversee their their local programs. I'd like to thank Ryan for coming on the Aptitude Outdoors podcast and would highly encourage you to check out his book, A Real Job. Let's talk to Ryan one last time to learn where you can get the book. So A Real Job is only one place. Uh, it's only sold on Amazon. Um, so you can buy that whenever you want. Uh, it's called, uh, well, it's spelled R-E-E-L. So it's a play on words. Um, so yeah, buy that online, check it out. Uh, the second book, like I said, should be coming out March of 24. So just in a couple months. Um, I'm pretty excited about that one. And then casthope.org, uh, that's the information on the nonprofit and what we're doing with kids. And, uh, yeah, there's a donate button on there. If you want to get involved financially or just want to read more information, there's actually quite a few really good videos, um, of kids that have come through our program and, um, some pretty inspirational stuff that we've, we've done with the kids over the years. 